Claire Hunter, journalist producer, C L A R E dot H U N T E R at hotmail dot com, zero four two one one six two two eight six. Looking pale and thin and dressed in a military uniform, Israel's lost son was returned to his family after five years of imprisonment behind enemy lines. In his first interview with Egyptian state television, Sergeant Major Shalit says he hopes his release will bring peace to Israel and Palestine. In a rare moment, many people from both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli border are celebrating in unison. Samir Sabawi from Australians for Palestine. There are thousands of mothers who are now enjoying the embrace of their sons coming home and wives who are enjoying the embrace of their husbands. With his return, Shalit brought jubilation and relief, but also anger and despair. Jeremy Jones from the Australia-Israeli Review sees the release of more than a 1,000 Palestinian prisoners as bittersweet. He says while Shalit's been returned to his family, murderers were released before serving their sentences. You can feel the pain of somebody who is seeing the murderer of their uh, daughter being released uh, as much as you can see the uh, joy with which uh, people are, are greeting uh, the reunification of Gilad Shalit with his family. He says the move to exchange the soldier for Palestinians might give the wrong message to extremists. If it is something where uh, a terrorist group says, oh, we can kidnap somebody, then we can negotiate the return of people, uh, then you know it's a different question altogether. Sameh Sabawi from Australians for Palestine says the negotiations cleared the way for more talks. It really shows us that Israeli authorities and the, and the Palestinian leadership can, in fact, sit down and, and talk and can bring something that would bring happiness to their people as opposed to, to bring more heartache and more sorrow. Dr Michael McKinley from Australian National University says the deal's groundbreaking for Palestinian group Hamas, but he says the road to peace is no closer for either side. In my view, particularly while Netanyahu is uh, Prime Minister, this is not going to uh, suggest anything other than some sort of short-term blip. Dr McKinley paints a bleak picture for the Middle East in the immediate future. Israel will be under siege. Raids will take place into Lebanon, into Gaza, that the Palestinians will continue to be repressed and that will drive even more Palestinians into violence and into exile. Claire Hunter, QUT News. Networking is a fundamental skill for successful job hunting. But what if you're one of the first people in your community to graduate from university and you're looking to enter into the corporate world with no contacts? The Australian Indigenous Corporate Network is the first of its kind and is designed to promote career and talent development and help build a presence for Indigenous people working in Australia's corporate sector. Diversity Council CEO Noreen Young is behind the program. She says other minority groups have been building on corporate relationships for years and a network for the Indigenous community is well overdue. She says the network will build on the cultural networking that occurs naturally in the communities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia is in fact one big network. It's a matter of bringing people together who are working in the corporate environment um, so sharing can occur. Professor Peter Buxkin, Dean of the David Unipon College of Indigenous Education and Research, is the think tank behind a national Indigenous teaching drive. He's been networking for 30 years and, as an Indigenous Australian, sees the move as a real leg up for job seekers. Um, you know, to learn from what non-Indigenous people have in terms of their networks. As I said, you know, their alumni, their associations, them gathering together as um, like-minded people to for mutual benefit. And we've got to learn from that and, and indeed uh, have a critical mass of people thinking in the same direction. But he fears the job landscape for the Indigenous community is still peppered with racism. I think non-Indigenous Australia still has very low opinions of, in, of Indigenous Australian as the first peoples, um, low expectations and, and, and not a, a real understanding. University student Hannah Donnelly is one of the first people in her Camilleroy community of northern New South Wales to graduate. She agrees with Professor Buxkin and says during her job hunt, workplaces with a cultural friendly atmosphere are on the top of her list cultural safety and just communicating that those places are culturally safe places is a very important thing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Hannah says she found networking in the city helped her connect with the community she left behind. Also important kind of in a professional sense but also in a cultural sense for Indigenous people coming from communities and then moving to like a completely different city. 
The Australian Indigenous Corporate Network is a free event starting in Sydney and will be making its way around the capital cities over the next few months. Claire Hunter, QUT News. Waxing, plucking, shaving and lately, lasers. Women and an increasing number of men these days are doing more and more to remain hairless. And it seems if they run out of time to shave, they avoid going out. My legs were really hairy and I forgot to shave, so I was like, uh, can we just do it another time? Or change outfits. Obviously if they're mammoth, yeah, I'll, I'll wear pants. But when they do have the time, more and more women are putting themselves in danger for silky smooth skin, according to the latest research from consumer group Choice. Ingrid Eust, from Choice, found some clients are suffering painful injuries because of a lack of training among salon staff who use laser and IPL treatment for hair removal. She says the industry needs a national regulation. Um, we certainly believe there's a need for national regulation to develop standards for laser and intense pulsed light for IPL use. Queensland regulates the laser treatment industry, but not IPL, which uses radiation to stop hair growth. Siobhan Connolly from the New South Wales Burns Unit says she's seen firsthand some of the injuries associated with extreme hair removal treatments. We've had a few patients brought to us for treatment following burns from hair removal methods and some of them have been laser hair removal and the IPL which is the intense pulse light. And they can be in particularly awkward areas. In those sensitive areas the skin can be thinner and less exposed to things like light so it ha it's more fragile. Ingrid Eust says the problems arise because the machines used for laser and IPL are so cheap. It means that, that anyone who wants to set up a business can essentially do that with minimal training, in some cases no training um, or licensing. Meredith Jones, body image academic and author of the book Hair, is alarmed. She says society's expectation on women is to blame. This is the culture that we live in. There's nothing at all wrong with being hairy. You know, it's a completely, it's part of being human. But the culture that we live in at the moment has developed, you know, certain ideas of what's beautiful. Her concern is the hair-free fad will soon go out of fashion. If, if you've decided to remove all your pubic hair now, permanently, then what do you do when the fashion changes? Do you then have to, you know, buy a little pubic wig? Claire Hunter, QUT News.